Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course on the Windows boot process. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to go through what CompTIA wants us to know about identifying the fundamentals of using operating systems. This is from the Essentials Exam 220-601 in Section 3.1. We're going to talk about something called the POST, the Power On Self-Test. We'll move from there to discussing the Master Boot Record, or the MBR. Then we'll talk more about Windows and how it's starting up the system with something called the NT Loader. And then finally, we'll discuss other Windows boot process files that are really important to know for the CompTIA exam. So let's start uh, talking about what happens when we boot Windows 2000 and Windows XP. There's a lot of things that happen on the screen, but behind the scenes is quite a bit of work that's going on just to get things up and running. The first thing that starts up is something called the POST, the Power On Self-Test. Before you see anything coming onto your display, before the very first pixel is lit up on your, on your display, you're having your system automatically start doing some tests. It's looking for a video card. It's testing some memory. And then it finally starts some things up on the screens. And you see it going through the post process. You may see it counting through memory. You may see it showing what hard drives happen to be available in your system and what, what floppy drives or CD-ROMs might happen to be there. And there's this initial inventorying process that begins. That is a critical step in what's happening from this point forward. If the BIOS of your system, when it's performing this power on self test, doesn't see that piece of hardware, your operating system is absolutely not going to see that piece of hardware. So one of the first things we ever do when we're trying to troubleshoot a problem on our Windows, we're not seeing a hard drive or we're not seeing a CD-ROM, one of the questions you may be asked is, well, does your BIOS see the CD-ROM? Does your system itself see the hard drive? And what you can do is, to, is shut your computer down, turn it back on, and start the BIOS process. There's another video where we talked about troubleshooting using the BIOS, where you can use the F2 or the delete key or whatever key is appropriate for your BIOS when it starts up to be able to go in and see what your BIOS sees. And if you don't see the hard drive, you'll know why Windows doesn't see the hard drive. So that is a very critical step, something to keep in mind when doing any type of troubleshooting in any operating system. So as this goes through, it also performs a hardware diagnostic. The amount of diagnostics that it does is determinate to the BIOS and how you may have the BIOS configured. It may be a quick one. It may be a very detailed one. But often you'll see an error pop up. And you'll know that some piece of hardware on your system isn't working properly according to this very quick diagnostic that's taking place. So if the BIOS can't use the hardware, the operating system certainly is not going to be able to use the hardware. And when that happens, you'll get an error code. It may be beeps. It may be a code that's displayed on the screen. It may be a set of text codes that pops up that you may not be able to understand completely. And that is something that you would then take and put into an internet web page or look in your diet, the uh, manual for your BIOS to determine what that is and what does that error mean, where you should start troubleshooting, what happens to be going on with that error. There are also these diagnostics cards that you can buy that will plug into, this one plugs into both an ISA bus or a PCI bus. You just turn it on the appropriate side to plug into the bus of your system. And it communicates with the BIOS and displays uh, some numbers on its screen that you can then use to help troubleshoot what's going on inside of your system. So very low level type troubleshooting with the motherboard and with the BIOS itself. But it's really helpful if you're having problems during this power on self test process. Previous versions of the CompTIA A plus certification exam required that you know a lot of knew a lot of details, a lot of numbers about the postcodes. You don't really see that on the exam anymore. They just want you to understand what happens during the post and why that's important for what's going on. Now let's say your system finishes the post process. The power on self test is complete. It's counted how much memory is inside of your system. It knows that there's some hard drives there. There may be a floppy drive, a CD-ROM, uh, all of the other components inside of your system. It's done a quick diagnostics, and it said, great, we can continue. The first thing the BIOS does is try to find on the very first hard drive that you have. That's the way you've configured your BIOS. Most BIOSes are configured that way. It goes out to the first hard drive into something called the master boot record. The master boot record is generally on the very first sector of the very first hard drive inside of your system. And this is the place where the BIOS knows to go first and foremost. Really, it doesn't know very much about what's on the hard drive. It just knows that to get things running, it should check in with the master boot record, hand things over to the master boot record, 
because that's where all the information is going to be held about where the partitions are on your hard drives and more importantly where the first bootable partition is on your hard drive. We'll talk more about partitions and bootable partitions in a video that's coming up very soon. Now for Windows, the partition holds uh, some information. This is a copy of a master boot record. You can start to see some of the errors are even in here. If you don't have a bootable partition, you may see that it says invalid partition table or error loading operating system or missing operating system if you don't happen to have a bootable partition. And so that's where those messages are coming from, right from your master boot record. The master boot record hands things over to your Windows bootable partition. And the, there's boot sector code inside of there that starts up a program on your hard drive called ntldr.exe. That's in that bootable partition. That's the NT loader. And the NT loader is a very critical part of what happens from this point on. So at this point, we've not really done a lot of Windows specific things. This process happens for any operating system that might be running on your system. It's finally that the master boot record has found out where it needs to boot, that it goes to your system drive that happens to be Windows and runs a program called ntloader.exe. So let's find out more about this ntloader. It's a very important part of what Windows does when it's starting up. Before your operating system can get up and running, it needs to make sure that it can access all the data that it's going to need to start running applications, getting your desktop up and running, making sure it can load device drivers and communicate to other pieces of hardware in your system. So the first thing that it looks for is something called ntbootdd.sys. This is a file that is created. It's a system driver that is put into the, the boot partition of your hard drive when you've installed Windows if you happen to have a SCSI hard drive. Because Windows out of the box needs a driver for the most part to be able to communicate with these SCSI devices. If you need that kind of disk support in your system, you're going to find that ntbootdd.sys driver loaded in there. Now ntbootdd.sys just happens to be the system driver for your type of SCSI drive that happens to be renamed to ntbootdd.sys. If you have another computer that also has SCSI drives, but it's a different SCSI controller, and you try to use this same .sys file on that system, you'll find that it doesn't work. Because every time you install Windows, you're really customizing the NT boot DD just for that version of Windows. So you'll, you may look on your system, and if you don't have a SCSI drive, you won't see this file. But if you do have a SCSI drive that needs this level of support, you'll see it right in the root uh, of that hard drive. It's going to load up. One of the first things it does is load up that system driver so that it can then access everything else that's on that drive. At this point, our NT loader processes something called the boot.ini file, boot.ini. This is a file that comes up and, and gives you a list of different operating systems that you can start. Or it may give you options for starting the same operating system. We'll talk more about that in future versions. If you have multiple operating systems on a hard drive, you might be dual booting. You might be running Windows 2000 and running Windows XP. You'll get a menu that pops up that says, which one would you like to run? That information and where those files are located, where those operating systems are located, are all documented in something called boot.ini. Let me show you what one looks like. This is my Windows XP desktop. And in my computer, I'm going to go right to my hard drive. And I can see a lot of different files are on my hard drive. Now, you'll notice that I've turned on my Windows Explorer so that I not only can see the system files that are on my hard drive, but I also put the extensions out here so you can start to see the, the full names of these files as they're stored. There's our NT loader. It's right there in the root directory of our hard drive. And there is our boot.ini. I'm going to right mouse click on that and open it up. I could also double click on boot.ini to open it up. This is just a text file. There's nothing fancy about boot.ini. You can see the first thing it says, this is the bootloader. The timeout is 30 seconds. If there are options available for us to choose, it waits 30 seconds and then it chooses the default, which is listed here, which happens to be on multi zero, disk zero, R disk zero on partition one in the Windows directory is the Windows operating system. In fact, it's the Microsoft Windows XP Professional. And when it launches Windows XP Professional, it executes with these extra settings off to the side. We'll talk more about these settings and how to customize a boot INI in a future video. But this is 
It's just an overview to give you a feel for what's contained in the Boot Any. If there are other operating systems on your hard drive, you're going to find other operating systems listed here. I can also put the same operating system in here with different startup options. You'll find if you're starting from a, from a, a, a crash and Windows says, would you like to start in safe mode, it's really starting the exact same information up with just some different options off to the side that starts it up in a safer mode than it is when it's running normally. Let's say that our boot.ini has prompted us to start an operating system. We've hit Enter. Next thing that happens, an NT loader starts a program called ntdetect.com. And you may see it on your screen as detecting hardware. It'll give you a prompt up there. What this is is the operating system, Windows, is now going out to all of the hardware that happens to be connected to your system, and it starts initializing it so they can then communicate with it. If any piece of hardware is not working properly and Windows is not able to connect to it, you may find that Windows takes a long time to boot up. You Normally during this process on the screen, Windows is showing you a bar moving across, letting you know that something is happening behind the scenes. One of the options that we can put into our boot INI is to get rid of the graphical front end and to show you every time a piece of hardware is loaded up. Let me show you what that might look like. I've modified the boot any that we had before. We're still using the same default and the same timeout, but I've added a new line that happens to load exactly the same operating system. I really copied and pasted this line before it, and I added this Windows XP Professional with SOS. So there's this slash SOS command line uh, function at the end of this that's going to give us more details about the operating system drivers as it's loading. So let's save this and let's restart Windows and see what happens. Our system is restarting, and now you can see I've got an option when the operating system is starting that says I could either run Microsoft Windows XP Professional or I can run Microsoft Windows XP Professional with SOS. So it's exactly the same text that I added to my boot any that allowed me to do that. So I'm going to choose the run it with the SOS and see what happens. And let's start it up and see where it goes. Notice all these things are now going across the screen. And then it started up my Windows into a different view in this Windows XP. And now it's going to start up and show me more information about what's going on. If we were going to troubleshoot our system and it was hanging on a piece of hardware, as that big long list was going by, we would be able to see where it stopped. And we'd know that is the specific piece of hardware that was causing our problem when Windows was just trying to start up. And then we can go from here and start doing other things, uh, troubleshoot our hardware, replace the system, swap out components, and do normal troubleshooting of our system just by changing one of those little lines in our boot.ini. Now that we've gone through the process of starting our boot.ini, we've initialized hardware. The next thing that our NT loader needs to do for us is start two other programs. One is an NTOS kernel.exe. This is the kernel of the operating system itself. So this is a very important component of loading the operating system up. The other piece that's important is loading something called HAL.dll. This is something called the hardware abstraction layer. This is what the Windows operating system uses to communicate to the hardware that's in our system. This was a very important piece when Windows was first introduced because up to this point, applications had direct access to the hardware that was on your system. That was pretty good whenever there was only one application running at a time. But Windows introduced this concept of multitasking. Multiple applications can be running simultaneously. And if one application was accessing a piece of hardware and another application tried to access the same piece of hardware, there would be a conflict. So Windows created this, this hardware abstraction layer so that the operating system handled the communication going back and forth to the hardware. So in Windows, Everybody talks to Hal to be able to communicate to the hardware and then back out again. And finally, now that we've got a kernel and we've got a way to talk to our hardware, our NT loader finishes up its big process here by loading something called a registry hive called HKey Local Machine System. And that's where the system components, the system configuration is stored in your system so that you can then have your initial operating system configuration begin, and then it can begin uh, performing the normal processes that it does to get up and running with the operating system. So everything about your system and the way that it's running is going to be inside of that hive. If you ever want to go into regedit and look in your HK local machine slash system, you'll see a lot of things in there dealing with the system getting up and running. Finally, 
the NT bootloader is done. The NT operating system is now loaded, and it transfer everything over to the NT kernel that it loaded earlier. And now the kernel is in charge of making sure everything from that point on is running properly. On the CompTIA A plus exam, you can certainly expect to see some questions about the startup process with Windows. And so these are the important boot files you need to keep in mind. We talked about the NT loader, obviously extremely important in getting your system up and running with that entire process that we just talked about. The boot.ini file that we looked at and we edited in our system and we saw by making those changes what effect that it had on our system. Simple text file with all that operating system information in it. Also, ntdetect.com, which goes out and detects the hardware in our system. We actually saw it detecting that when we changed our boot any and watched all of those different drivers fly across the screen. If you missed that, rewind the video. Go look at those drivers go by. There's a lot that happens in a very short period of time. If you do have a SCSI hard drive or another SCSI component on your system, you'll also see this ntbootdd.sys. And if you have a question on your exam that deals with something that has nothing to do with SCSI, and yet ntbootdd.sys is one of the answers, you'll know that that's a red herring. You're only going to see that ntbootdd.sys file if there is a SCSI component that's important for operating system to use when it starts up. The NT kernel itself is called ntoskrnl.exe. And that kernel, once everything gets up and running, is in charge of making sure the rest of the operating system continues to operate. And we finally have HAL, HAL.dll. HAL.dll is our hardware abstraction layer and an extremely important part of Windows being able to access the hardware that's on your system. Although these important files I'm about to tell you about are useful in Windows, certainly in some legacy Windows environments, they're not incredibly important for getting started, but still important for the overall operation of your computer. One, two of them are called system.ini and win.ini. They are still in Windows 2000, Windows uh, XP. They're still in Vista because legacy applications still use these configuration files to get up and running. System.ini and Win.ini have been replaced by the registry. But prior to that, they were these text files that Windows used to have everything get configured. If any of these files got corrupted or had a problem with it, Windows would stop working. So the System.ini and Win.ini used to be very, very important files. These days, very few applications even bother connecting to or reading anything from those files. But you may find on legacy systems that applications are still using those to store information and retrieve information. Another file that's useful, very important for the booting process and troubleshooting, is something called sysedit.exe. This is a configuration file editor that's even still available in Vista today that allows you to quickly edit winini, systemini, config.sys, and autoexec.bat. If you've been around in the industry for a while, you would recognize some of these file names. None of these are used in XP. None of them are really used in Windows 2000, certainly not in Vista. But again, these legacy applications sometimes will go back to these configuration files. So they, re they were very useful in Windows 95 and Windows 98. And uh, they're still there in XP 2000 and Vista, just not used very often. Another file that's very useful in the latest Microsoft operating systems is something called msconfig.exe. And msconfig is really taking the place of these legacy editors and provides you now with a lot more functionality and troubleshooting than you had before. Let me show you what it does. To start msconfig, I'm going to go to my Start menu. I'm going to click on Run and type in msconfig and hit Enter. msconfig.exe is our system configuration utility. And notice I do have functionality here to edit my system any, my win any, but notice boot any is in there. In fact, there's the configuration changes. So instead of starting up our boot any and editing it in Notepad, gosh, I could have come right here. In fact, it's got a number of the boot options available in here very easy to use and something you can easily click on. And you know you're not going to make a typing error just because you added that in there. You can also add and change services that are running on startup, the programs themselves that run on startup. And then there's some other tools available to help you do some maintenance and some management of this system. So if you're troubleshooting, this, this msconfig.exe functionality, extremely useful. And it can help you find a lot of things very quickly, especially when someone has changed their system around. None of these icons are on the screen. The system's not booting as you would expect. A lot of functionality here. And we'll talk more about this in a future video.
Well, that's how to get Windows started. We've gone through our Power On Self test. We now know where the master boot record is and what it does next to get our Windows system up and running. And we learned all about how the NT loader is such a very important part of the boot process. And finally, looked at some other Windows boot process files and things that we can use to help troubleshoot the boot process in the future. For more A-plus videos, to participate in our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com.